it's great that we've got kind of a plethora of experience within. So this talk is specifically panel, specifically about anxiety. I'm sure that we'll get a little diverted down a few rabbit holes, but let's start with anxiety. Um, where and how are we diagnosing anxiety and deciding that psilocybin is the right therapy versus a CBDA versus a, you know whole plant medicine versus you know any other sort of options that we look at in in healthcare world when we're trying to treat symptomatic diagnoses. I'll start that as a psychologist because we love anxiety. Often it's checklists, observe behavior, and patient self-report. Um, we use the work list to identify and then see the cause and effect. And uh, so that's kind of where you start. You know, make sure you're looking at the same animal before you can guess what's working with it. And um, the amazing thing about psilocybin and mixing it with cannabinoids is that it hits your anxiety levels from a biochemistry standpoint. In, uh, there we go. That's pretty loud. Um, yeah. Um, so I think that both of these compounds, the cannabinoids, the psilocybin, are very mutually exclusive in treating anxiety and helping with anxiety. I know from my experiences that mixing the two is where the treatment should come to get the total um, you know, freeing, calming feeling. And from that physiological standpoint, it's exactly where the psilocybin and then the cannabinoids hit at the receptor sites, and we've been talking about that one all day, so we'll definitely talk more about that. That, that kind of leads me to another good question that I think you may be able to answer. So, obviously, cannabinoids work in the endocannabinoid system. Where is uh, the where where what is the pathway, the mechanism for psilocybin work? So as we or. You all might know, if you know a little about the endocannabinoid system, that the endocannabinoid system and your serotonin system kind of work together. Um, there isn't too much research on phytocannabinoids and your serotonin system, um, but what psilocybin does is it has a strong affinity for your uh, serotonin receptor 2A, which is 5-HT2A. Um, and that is interesting because that can be seen as your kind of an exciting receptor and the 1A, the serotonin 1A receptor can be seen kind of as the calming receptor. Psilocybin has that affinity for um, the 2A receptor and then cannabinoids like CBD have that affinity towards the 1A receptor. So it's this cool little, you know, as you say, the symphony. Um, that occurs when you mix these compounds together. So we're not totally sure about the full biochemistry of these interactions, but there is some research and we're starting to theorize among ourselves on what this could be. Can I say something too? So I work with CBDA and it's, the 5 h is a much more potent uh, agonist for the 5-HT1A and so it, it works well with anxiety, good research anxiety. Also, that's responsible for nausea and anticipatory nausea work through that same receptor, part of the serotonin system. So again, too, we're seeing that link there because uh, they're both kind of working in that same serotonin system. So when would it be a, a false understanding to think potentially that psilocybin is kind of blocking that excitability receptor? from allowing that excitability and then, and then that 1A expresses itself more? Let me back up a little bit okay. because I want to answer the question that you asked about anxiety. So anxiety is a diagnosis. Uh, in order for you to get clinical anxiety, you have to be diagnosed by a healthcare professional. There's ways to be able to tell if you have predispositions to different types of effects that can be classified as anxiety by a medical professional. So things like stress reactivity, uh, fear extinction, etc. These are all different types of symptomatic conditions that you can tell based on your genetic predispositions. So looking at your genes and looking at something called a single nucleotide polymorphisms within 
every single biomarker, you have a different expression of what's called nucleotides. So think about genes in this way. We inherit our genes from our parents. A lot of them are locked in. So, you know, our, our skin color, our eye color, our hair uh, color, or, you know, ma ma uh, male pattern baldness, I guess, locked in too, which I have. But other genes are, think of them as on off switches. So, based on what you do with your life, you can turn those switches on or off. Most of us are operating in the blind. We don't know what our genetic predispositions are, so we're trying different things to see if something's gonna be turned on or off. So if we know that we have a predisposition to stress of activity, and we know that we may be prone to anxiety, and we're consuming substances that actually turn those on, we can have an adverse event. So being able to know in advance if you're predisposed to that will help you guide yourself to a therapeutic uh, approach to be able to address uh, anxiety. There's different compounds that do that. There's different psychotropes. There's a lot of research, FDA approved research that is happening now on different compounds. You're looking at M M MDMA, you're looking at ketamine, which is also disassociative and is legal. You're looking at psilocybin, LSD, ibogaine, etc. All of them have an affinity for similar receptor sites, as we were talking about the 5-HA-2A uh, receptor. But I just want to mention that all these different substances, what they do is they bind to a receptor and create our own neurochemistry. So every single substance that we take, we consume uh, THC, binds to the CD1 receptor, releases an andamide. Uh, you know, same thing with psilocybin, releases serotonin, there's oxytocin, all these different things are our own neuro neurochemistry. So being able to guide ourselves to an experience that's individualized has to start with your own personal knowledge about your own neurochemistry, and then being able to guide yourself to what is the right therapeutic process for yourself. So Wolfgang, when you're cultivating cultures then, are you thinking, or maybe you can tell, tell us more about what's the medium that you're growing in? Does it affect the production of different compounds and besides different strains? Uh, yeah, it absolutely does. Even in between strains of the same cultivar, you're going to get a big variance of alkaloid content or doing just based upon what you're growing on or in, or if you're supplementing, or yeah. So currently, uh, I would say most growers are growing on just coca corn, just dirt cheap, right? Problem is, tryptamine content's not completely there. There's actually a noticeable difference, probably about 0.2% difference in total alkaloid content between using something like a manure or something supplemented with L-tryptophan compared to just straight coca corn, coconut husk. And are you feeding that coconut husk at all throughout uh, that life cycle, or are you just allowing the... You're just letting it decompose, decompose in the mycelium, it. yeah. Um, if you're supplementing something like L-tryptophan, uh, it's just the way the mushroom enzymatically breaks it down, provides to its tryptamine content. And what sort of strains are you, of mushrooms are you working on? Uh, a good variety of uh, just therapeutics in general. I think I've thought about this, so I just want us to, because psilocybin is something, you know, it's been around forever, but now we're, we're going through the legal process. Can we just learn from the cannabis industry about this whole strain name? Uh, I mean, Alaskan Thunderfuck is the name of a strain of a cultivar of cannabis, PSMB. I was just going to say, I had experience personally with an albino penis MB, which was extremely powerful. I, we don't need these names. We need to understand what is the amount of psilocybin that's in there. We need to understand the components of that. So let's kind of take uh, notice of the cannabis industry and not repeat that, please. Yeah. And, and I feel like where we are with the mushroom industry right now is kind of where we were in the days where you would call it cushion chronic. You're like, what is this? It's cush. What is this? It's chronic. What is this? Penis envy. It's the, kind of the same thing. And I feel like we need to evolve the space. We're getting there with the cannabis 
uh, cultivars right now where we're kind of having the scientific names with it. So uh, I, I feel like we're in that space where we were about 20 years ago in the cannabis space. And hopefully we can get to this point faster than we do with cannabis. Yeah. <laughs> I, agree. I, I agree that strain names are a marketing tool, basically. Uh, but they do usually connotate that it, this strain is going to have generally this grouping of cannabinoids and this grouping of terpenes. In mushrooms, similarly, you have strains of mushrooms that are going to have different functional compounds or different psychedelic compounds. So there's some accuracy to being able to name those groups of mushrooms, yes? If there was accuracy to that, yeah. uh, you know, one of the things that I used to do... Um, and is that just because the, the research is still immature in that specific area? No, it's because it's, it's all about branding and lack of regulation. So I'll give you everyone an example. So I used to work uh, with a company called Medicinal Genomics. I got five new dreams. Everybody knows Blue Dream. That's a strain or a cultivar. I would bring it to my lab, extract the DNA, purify it, and send it to a sequencer. Two of them looked identical, so they are Blue Dream based on what we had as a reference. Two other ones were across a Blue Dream. So there was Blue Dream in it, but it was not Blue Dream. And the fifth one was not even close to Blue Dream, didn't have any characteristics of Blue Dream, it was just called Blue Dream. So yes, there should be a guide by, this is the terpene profile and the cannabinoid profile of a cultivar that's supposed to be Blue Dream, but until the testing protocols get to a point where we can actually know exactly what we're calling things, uh, I think there's uh, you know, room for a lot of room for error and interpretation. The other part of it is I don't think the FDA or any regulating body that's looking at our therapeutic products as medicine or wellness product are going to approve anything that's called Alaskan Thunder Fire. <laughs> so, so, Jen, now that we have kind of a base understanding of how we're cultivating those mushrooms, trying to design those compounds, we're extracting them. You're, you, you know, come across a patient who's got anxiety. Where are we beginning that process then with microdosing, or what is the dosing? And how are we individualizing that based on somebody's particular symptoms or their genomics potentially? Well, I have two expert dosing guys here. <laughs> so we were talking about um, dosing a lot earlier today, and um, it's important to know how much psilocybin you're getting. You know, I said one percent. You were like, you're lucky to get one percent. It's more like half a percent that you're getting. Um, as far as microdosing standards, you know, when I said to you, I was like, I take about 250, 300 milligrams. And what you said, wow, that's so much. Of fruit. Yes. Okay. Uh, that's very important <laughs> to determine um, when you're talking about microdosing too, because if you're talking about a concentrate, that's gonna be different than the whole plant. Just think about it in the same respect as a cannabis flower versus a cannabis concentrate. Um, it's gonna have similar differences. One's gonna be obviously way stronger. But as far as, um, um, milligram dosing, I've noticed anywhere from as low as 10 to 25 milligrams of uh, whole plant all the way, or whole body, um, all the way to about 500 milligrams. What I notice and what I've seen other people notice is above 500 milligrams, you the micro dosing kind of starts going into a real mushroom dose. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that varies by case. Yes, yeah. yeah. Can, can I just add to that? Please. It, it, varies, it, it definitely varies by people. Uh, we have a group of uh, genes called cytochrome P450 that produce enzymes that metabolize different things in our bodies. So there's one called CYP2D6 that actually metabolizes uh, psilocybin or, and also uh, LSD and other substances. And there's also some um, uh, evidence of uh, CYP2C uh, 9 and 1 9, which are also a phytocannabinoid metabolizers, so C1, uh, C2 C9 uh, metabolizes THC. So, understanding what type of metabolism you are will help guide your dosing protocol as well. For some people who are poor metabolizers, 
will happen is the onset will take a little bit longer and it can be a lot more intense. So all four of us can take the same exact amount and all four of us can have a completely different experience. So a microdose to me may not be a microdose to you. This, and also after time, you know, we think maybe you build up a tolerance so you need an additional dose. But understanding what your metabolic function is is really important before you start dosing as well. So Janet, let's continue on there. As I'm traditionally guiding someone through a therapy, I'm generally using somewhere between that 250 to 500 milligrams ish. Um, you know, and it's somewhat dependent on, as we know, percentage of you know psilocybin up to the total weight. Where are you observing, you know, really therapeutic benefit for the patient and where do you notice maybe that they're now going more into a, a, a more mushroom trick kind of dose? Well, I have to clarify, I am a CBD person. I, Got it. And okay. also, as a person working in the field with people, my understanding, except for like Denver and one other city, I think it's still a Schedule One mm -hmm. uh, substance. So it's not part of my practice. Oregon. Oregon, yeah, I should have got to Colorado. It's going to be more. So anyway, if I have researched it, but again, as far as bringing it into practice, I haven't done that yet. Um, I am into, I can tell you all about dosing for CBDA and different things of that nature, but uh, no, uh, let's wait. And where are you at with dosing with CBDA for just a, a treatment of anxiety? Um, for anxiety, we start with our basic 800 milligram bottle, half the dose is 13 milligrams, and the full dose is 26. Most people's sweet spots around 20. But it, again, too, I don't have genetics, but I see reactions. And so I do a lot of Zoom calls and follow up with people and do a lot of uh, follow up treatment. And so we start with that old hack in the industry of start low and go slow. Yeah. Um, so I do that, but very quickly, if I have somebody I can say with severe autism who's aggressive and horrible problems, we don't start slow. Yeah, and we talk to the parents, like for the first three days do this, and then you can go up to this. Yeah. People with like cancer and seizures, we, and they ask for that too, ask for like a 3200. So it varies so much by the person. And then I just observe and stay in touch with them. Real common problems I don't, again, to like a severe anxiety or severe thing, just to see how it's working. Because everybody can say it's just incredibly different. So maybe we should, we should chat with you about the genetic thing. Um, so I just do it by talking to them and dealing with it and adjusting the doses. Uh, it doesn't usually get much more than about 100 uh, milligrams. Uh, Pretty full, typical anxiety. The full, and that, yeah, the anxiety people very rarely go anywhere near that. They usually get 800, around 20, sometimes 30 to 40 in the beginning. Some people have anxiety for sleep, which is another huge issue that we're dealing with now. I think nobody can sleep in America right now. <laughs> and so for that, they take the first dose an hour before bed, because the long-term sublingual works in our 20, 40 minutes, and so an hour before bed. I say, if you're still awake, after the hour, take more, figure out what it takes for your body to go to sleep. And over time, as like inflammation and pain are down, anxiety is down, stress is down, then often they end up at a lower overall uh, dosage. So, so there's some general guidelines, but I, I do a lot of individual adjustment. So Wolfgang, as a mycologist, is, I, I think, probably your, your best title. <laughs> do you? <laughs> do you? you <laughs> uh, so are you? taking your products and turning them into <laughs> doses that people could potentially use if they were in the and right. Hypothetically, you had time. Hypothetically, you had time. So, so what, where have you noticed as someone who's really touching the plant and, 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 and the okay. base fungus? So based upon the alkaline content of the biomass, uh, we've been dosing microdoses at somewhere between 100 milligrams to 200 milligrams, but of course everyone's gonna have their own regimen. It's been a lot of feel it up to yourself, to the individual user, it hasn't really been necessarily guided. In a more guided setting, I would recommend more of a one day on, two day off regimen, maybe the Thadamin regimen, one day on, one day off. Um, in a more therapeutic setting, doses would be somewhere two and a half grams to five. That's, that's assisted the whole way through. Yes. Um, and I've known some people who've done 28 grams. I've done, I've done like <laughs> half an ounce in one sitting before, like 14 grams. So. <laughs> and where, where is the science as to 
how that's different than rewiring the brain in terms of treating our anxiety so that we don't actually react to it versus treating it symptomatically with the microdosing. So, um, you know, you were saying the 2.5 to 5 uh, gram dose. In the research that they do, um, they've typically done the high dose being 2.5 grams, which, I mean, if you've done mushrooms a lot, you know that 2.5 grams is kind of just getting started. Um, <laughs> so that's why for that's me, your goal. that's, yeah, that's, I mean, for me, I personally just wanted to see what the human body is capable of with psilocybin and taking that much and seeing what the effects are, say, from 7 grams to 14 grams. Is there that much of a difference? Because if I take 1,000 milligrams of THC and then I add 500 milligrams more, I'm not really getting that much more high. Right. Um, so what I experiment with with these higher doses is to find out if the affinity that the psilocybin has for your uh, serotonin 2A receptor is the same at those higher doses as it is at those lower doses of like 2.5, 3.5 grams as it is like 14 grams. Um, the answer is no, it's completely different. <laughs> uh, like, it, you know, the, the whole thing we were uh, talking about, you, uh, you focus on this, like bad trips. Um, this is kind of the uh, dosing standard that you would go into to have bad trips. Um, but that's why I always recommend and people use uh, CBD before they use psilocybin as well um, to kind of balance out um, any of that other anxiety that might come. Um, I mean, if you've microdosed psilocybin, you know that um, it helps as an anti-anxiety, but there's just some things that it doesn't do. And then when you take that CBD, it kind of gives you that full spectrum of anxiety relief from what I've noticed. Um, so I, I think the higher doses, if you don't want to, if you don't want a bad trip, don't take them. But for me, I think that a bad trip is actually a positive thing for your spirit and your evolution and your growth. So maybe you should go fear things or go look at things that you fear head on um, instead of running away from them. So mushrooms can really help with that. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't really feel there's anything like a, a bad trip per se. Uh, they're all questions that you need to ask yourself. But from a therapeutic standpoint, the reason why we build our, our test that was specific for the endocannabinoid system uh, to look at psychotropics or, or an incident. Uh, so I was speaking to a uh, physician that was administering ketamine treatment in Florida, we work with uh, like five clinics there that do ketamine treatments. And I was on the phone with, with her and then I heard her motion yelling in the background and she said she's gotta call me back. So a few hours go by and she called me back and she said, uh, we had a patient that had, had a psychotic episode. Said, oh, uh, which is a disassociative experience, which ketamine is. So yeah. if we were, to be able to predict in advance. It wasn't really a psychotic episode per se, but it could have been a psychotic episode that was triggered by something. If we could predict in advance that this individual has genetic predispositions to various forms of anxiety, like stress activity, and there's a genetic, uh, there are genetic markers that can show you that in advance. So if you're, if you're gonna uh, administer psilocybin therapeutically, or ketamine or any of the other uh, psychotropic treatments and you know in advance that there is a potential adverse event that's associated with that psychotropic so maybe for ketamine use for depression can trigger anxiety for psilocybin anxiety can trigger depression there's a, there's an adverse event that's documented from there so if you know this in advance you can take measured action to be able to either do uh, administer a beta blocker, or as simple as holding somebody's hand through the process, that this thing can feel that they're not going to be alone. So understanding the predictive measures of that can help to get a much better experience for the individual. And the hand holding is actually true. They actually do that in the clinical studies. The, the doctors and researchers go and hold the hands of the patients while they're uh, tripping. <laughs> <laughs> I had a quick question too. So as a psychologist, I'm kind of anxious can I say? Uh, when you have people that have other psychological problems already, and how much those are screened for and monitored, 
Um, like I say, if someone does have psychotic episodes, you do know that before you start giving them something that can increase that. So just as a person who works with a lot of people with real life psychological issues, I'd be I'm pretty nervous when I say you know a lot more about it. Yeah, I mean, not, not to really geek out on the science, but I'll geek out on the science. Let's go. <laughs> so there are different genes that can give you a genetic predisposition to some of these episodes. Like uh, there is a gene or a, a SNP called FOG, fatty acid amide hydrolase, that breaks down an anandamide. So understanding if you have a homozygous allele combination, which is uh, just means two of the same nucleotides, if you have that, you produce more FOD and less anandamide. If you produce less anandamide, most likely you're prone to stress reactivity, to PTSD, and fear extinction. So to give everybody an example of how they're working, I'll, I'll get to psychosis in a second. Um, let's say we're at a, an event and we decide to consume a concentrate, whether we dab or whether we uh, consume a you know, concentrated oil bait. THC is a vasodilator, it dilates your blood vessels, your heart will pump faster, we'll all feel the same thing, my heart's racing a little bit, it's normal. If I have a stress reactivity gene, it can actually turn that on, and now I have an anxiety attack of some sorts. But if I have a predisposition to PTSD and fear extension, it's also going to say, oh, it's not only me in this uh, place now, but I, I remember I had this five years ago. So you're bringing that in. Or I remember when I fell off my bike when I was nine years old. So people that have PTSD, that come back, they replay the same movie over and over. Now, the second part of that is a gene called AKT1, a homozygous allele, same kind of thing, two nucleotides on that, give you a predisposition to psychomatic effects, which is psychosis-like effects. So people that have a predisposition to that, the anxiety that they're triggering through their therapeutic treatment or you know some mushrooms they took can trigger a psychotic episode if they're predisposed to that the same way that a concentrate of cannabis can trigger a, psychosis, a psychotic experience. So knowing this in advance will help to avoid those potholes along the way. So let me ask a follow-up question to that. So as a clinician, spiritual counselor, someone who's going to guide, I don't can't study their genomics, but are there certain groups of questions that I can ask that that user patient to, to really help guide? So um, I used to work as a bud tender um, for years, and one of the uh, really important things I learned was how to recommend a strain to somebody just by like being next to their personal space. And I could just feel their energy. Um, and you know, this isn't, there's no clinical study for this. Uh, we're talking about bioenergy and stuff. Yet yeah, we're getting there. But from just feeling their aura, I could recommend the right cannabis strain. Like I could see them, I'll be like, okay, this guy, like this guy right here, looks like he kind of would be a hybrid -y type person. Like if you see somebody that's really like me, then you might want to give, don't give them a strong like upper, you know? Um, so generally speaking, you can gauge those basic factors just by looking at the person and tapping into your own energy and then being one with theirs. And from there, you'll be able to recommend a proper strain and a proper dose as well. Um, you know, you'll be able, you'll see some people, you'll see, okay, this person looks like they're an anxious person. I'm not gonna give them a higher dose. Uh, you know, certain little factors like that. So. But there is science to <laughs> <laughs> That's good, we can feel each other's energies, and I think that's wonderful. But we can also use a little bit of science. So number one, anybody can do a DNA test, they're direct to consumer. Number two, yeah, I mean, I'll defer a little to you as well, but there's obviously questions you can ask, like, have you ever had an anxiety attack? Have you ever had a panic attack? Have you ever had a psychotic episode? So just ask them if they've ever experienced it in the past, and also ask them about their experience with psilocybin or uh, whatever they're consuming. And if they've never taken it before, then you know it's the adage of you know low and slow. Yeah, and I'm really into safety. Uh, I've just seen a lot of people. Um, my friends, the bed tenders. Um, 
so I, I had this store in Ojai, which is kind of a cool place. And so we're the health store, and then up the hill are free dispensaries. And so there is an issue because a lot of the bed tenders work, especially with like 80, people in their 80s that have pain from cancer, and they give them really high doses of THC, and they have they come in one day, they're just bumbling around, some guy fell laying on the ground for 10 hours. He said, I mean, there's just really a lack of training and awareness. And so, and that's just THC. So when we start talking about doing psilocybin, it kind of brings up my warning signals. Uh, especially anybody over the age of 20 who has some issues, some trauma, some problems, and then health issues combined. So there's checklists and all kinds of things you do, but yeah, I would just be so careful to err on either microdosing or not even adding it in because, yeah, causing somebody distress and reactivating a psychosis or even a serious anxiety or PTSD um, is not. You just don't play with that, and so I'm always worried about. I, I totally agree, and I think like bud tenders do a massive disservice and should learn more. But that's the problem with prohibition is that this should be the role of doctors, and because of legislation, that doctor-patient relationship doesn't exist, and then they have to go to some twenty-something-year-old kid who kind of knows, like doesn't know shit. Yeah. yeah. So Thank that's man. that's the problem, and I hope you know with this psilocybin treatment and these other psychedelic treatments, as we're seeing with like ketamine, it is in a clinical. Uh, um, place as they're doing it. So, well, damn. Well, that just reminds me too. I was talking to you earlier that you're to me the typical. Your average age is your male and about right around 33 or whatever are the typical users, and it's a very That's different great. stage of your life for one thing where you are experimenting and looking for adventure and highs and all those sorts of things. And so again, too, I'm just always cautioning. You know how young a child would you give it to? How old a person would you give it to? Um, and so again, too, your genetics are great, it's just that they're not everywhere. And so the majority of people will not use a genetic profile to determine a dosage or how much or even to give that to that person. And so I'll stick in my safe CBDA realm for now and maybe add you guys in later. <laughs> uh, just a quick mention, uh, you shouldn't really be feeling a whole bunch of effects if you're taking microdoses. It should be sub-perceptual. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, if, if you're taking it and you're feeling a little something, it's you know like a mini dose. It, that's fine. Uh, you, you shouldn't fall into a bad trip off microdosing. Is what I'm trying to get at. Uh, in, in, in a therapeutic sense, uh, setting, I should say, if you're going above that two and a half gram and you have someone with you, um, there there are ways um, to divert a bad trip. You know that. that um, he was talking about ketamine, ketamine and the dissociative, there's not really a way to counter that trip. But with uh, classical traditional psychedelics, it, it's a lot of grabbing the focus and attention of the person under the influence and redirecting it to you know, something lighter. Um, a big part of that too is set and setting. He talked about biological triggers. There's also situational triggers, just what do you have going on in life right now? You know, if it's that last week of the month, you got all your bills next, and, you know, like, don't trip. It's not gonna be fun. <laughs> so, it, there, there's just situational things you need to be aware of going on in your life as well. You know, if you take psychedelics and you don't, it, it might bite you, so. It, as your mycology experience, do you find that there's a particular mushroom or compound that is working best with uh, anxiety or from a mycological sense um, reishi has been a lot of uh, anti-anxiety we're talking about functional mushrooms right now um, but for like the therapeutic psychedelic side so when you're doing a functional mushroom like reishi are you still talking about microdosing that or is that something where you're taking a much larger dose um, both really um, you can do it the same way teas pills I a friend of mine does uh, reishi, spirulina, and psilocybe pills, and yeah. Um, sorry, I get lost. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, I've noticed that uh, higher doses, like when I take, uh, you know, 10 times the recommended dose of lion's mane, for example, um, I kind of get the feeling of, you know, there's a difference of when you take 20 milligrams of CBD and when you take 1,000 milligrams of CBD, and that's kind of the same feeling that you get, not the same exact bodily feeling, but kind of mimics that low dose to high dose feeling to where with the non-psychoactive mushrooms, you still can feel something just like with a higher dose of CBD, you clearly feel something is changing. Uh, but then that's not a microdose anymore. So um, to circle back to that question, um, 
Yeah, so certain strains are going to just have less alkaloid content based on how they were bred, like the genetic lineage they came from. Golden teachers are usually like the gentler ones. Um, but still, that comes down to how much exact tryptamine you're getting per dose. So, you know, if down the line we're working with isolates or something, it's going to be a lot more clinical. So, so I'm going to, we have about four or five minutes left. Is there some questions from the audience that, yeah? Um, how can you explain tolerances, like, you know, with, uh, and, but like in your ways of affinity and stuff like that? Uh, so for tolerance, I see a lot of people redosing improperly. Um, back to back day redosing if you're in a therapeutic setting, um, not microdosing. It, it, tolerance is like twice to three times the next day. It, it's crazy. So that's why every regimen is one day on at least one or two days off. Um, so, you, you, you have a two gram experience, you, you need four to six grams the next day to have something similar. Yeah. And is that applicable? I heard you kind of mention microdosing is not a... Uh, a lot of the microdosing regimens kind of factor that in. Um, so there, there is a slight tolerance upage with microdosing. So if you're microdosing and then you say you want to do like a macrodose or a therapeutic setting, you're, you're going to have to adjust your dosage. But um, for the most part, no, because the, a lot of the regiments factor in the um, off days. So, personal question. So, as I'm taking psilocybin, <laughs> I'm enjoying my microdose, and I'm about an hour and a half, two hours into it, and I want to continue to enhance that, but maybe not go to another level, just kind of keep there. Can I continue to take the same amount that I took it the first time to keep that sort of... Yes, so in a traditional sense, uh, the dosing after the initial dose just prolongs the length, not the intensity. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's All right, good to know. It's good to know. Um, <laughs> let's say you're just having that bad trip where you have uh, already done the microdosing. Um, does that, like CBD, help to, I know you said that you can guide them, mm -hmm. um, but does uh, taking a just say CBD, would that be like an emergency call that we can just, you know? I, I think the CBD is kind of preventative and you should use it before, before. you take it. Yeah, so it kind of helps balance out that ang any anxiety that you would have beforehand. Another thing that I recommend is doing breath work, um, like the Wim Hof method. If you do like five rounds of that, it's, the, it's just like a quick hyperventilation breath, which will help calm you down. Um, that is like a homeostatic regulator. I, if I, I, I teach breath work seminars too, so if y'all want to, I would love to uh, guide y'all through some of my breath work. And I have not done my hour of breath work, <laughs> but um, but yeah, I highly recommend CBD and breath work prior and like like right before you take it. Essentially, I'll take the CBD and then maybe like 15 minutes later, I'll eat the mushrooms. Um, but then like in that 15 minutes, I'm doing the like 15 minutes of breath work as well, so that by the time it starts metabolizing. Metabolizing, it starts efficiently metabolizing so that I don't feel any like, like I don't know if you guys ever feel this, but it kind of like set like a psychedelic will just center in one area of your body yeah. and it just like pushes in that area. With that breath work, it really helps uh, like move that energy throughout your body like equally. Does that, does that change the enhancement, like the CBD taking it prior to it? I would say any of the anxiety you would have is going to get balanced out okay. much better. Like, I don't really get anxiety when I take a few hundred milligrams of CBD before um, okay. mushrooms. And I'll just jump in too. So again, too, the CBDA, as we've gone through research, is 10 to 100 times even higher in terms of its effectiveness than the CBD. And the CBDA directly interacts with the 5-HT1A and does balance. You know, the serotonin helps us balance that anxiety. So if people take it a lot, you know, if you're on too much THC, yeah. it's very common. Um, as a rescue drug. It's a rescue drug. It's also, even in opioids, it's very calming. It's also helps with addiction to those yeah. types of things. So I'm very strong with the CBDA. It's just very different. It doesn't have the dosing curve that CBD does. If you reach a point where in the morning, that's going to help, and CBD does not have that. Oh, it doesn't have that. Yeah. yeah. So I would highly recommend the CBD before. And keep it there. I mean, it's going to, it's calming, relaxing. And it actually kicks in and is a, has a stronger effect when you're under stress. Mm -hmm. And so if you're having the bad trip or fear that you are, uh, have some CBD handy, so then we'll even stick it in, and it's going to help uh, balance that so you don't go there. We're basically done, but there was one more question in the back. Yeah, uh, thank you for all the scientific information. Really appreciate it. Uh, 
from an industrial perspective or investments, regulation, sometimes that's considered a bad word. I'd like to hear maybe just a little bit from everyone or if anyone's ever thought of this before. The conflict of interest with the FDA and pharmaceutical companies, for example. <laughs> How do we know that that's a that's a whole nother thing. Proactively, how do we get investors and regulation to help open the doors and get more testing and get more <coughs> research going without that conflict of interest? Like if I have a capitalist The way we did it in weed was we just sold it just do it until we had enough capital. <laughs> 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 There is no longer a conflict of interest. Yeah. GW Pharmaceuticals already showed that you can get a cannabinoid through the FDA. That's what Jazz bought them for seven point three billion dollars. Wow. So you, the, the way to do that is not to fight it, but to work with it. The FDA uh, has a uh, a category called medical food products that they approve, which under that you have multiple compounds that are approved as a therapeutic FDA approved substance. The, the challenge that we have with all this FDA pharmaceutical is that they're used to individual compounds. So taking an individual compound, going through the FDA approval process and a, a clinical trial defeats the purpose of using the entire plant to provide an, an experience. So until we're able to work with them and show them how to work, that's where the conflict comes in. Pharmaceutical companies are all, all for that. They'll, GW has patents on CTV and all the other cannabinoids as well. So it's the, the ability to be able to guide them through the process of showing how we can make money with them. And I think it, it'll be much less of a conflict that way. Well, I hate to shut it down, but we're past time. I'm sure all these guys would be happy to uh, talk to you afterwards. I really appreciate it. Thank you.